Number 10, Where's My Mummy? Interior of a Kitchen, Oil on Canvas by Martin Drolling was painted in 1815 and depicts shades of browns, tans, beiges, and golds that were remarkable of the era. Where did he get these colors, some had wondered. Well, good old Martin had a little help from the dead. Mummy Brown was appropriately named as it was made up of, you guessed it, ground up mummies. From the 16th to the 19th century, many painters favored the pigment and it remained available well into the 20th century, even as supplies dwindled. Egyptian mummies are rare nowadays, not because a few survived thousands of years in their tombs, but because few survived the aesthetic and cannibal demands of Europeans. Eating Egyptian mummies reached its peak in Europe by the 16th century. Mummies could be found on apothecary shelves, either in broken shards or ground into powder. So why did these nutcase Europeans believe that there was medicinal value in a mummy? Bitumen. Abundant in the Middle East where formed in geological basins of the remains of tiny plants and animals, it could be semi-liquid or semi-solid. It is viscous when heated and hardened when dried, making it useful for broken bones and rashes. Supposedly bitumen with wine cured chronic coughs and combined with vinegar, it'll dissolve clotted blood. Other uses included the treatment of cataracts, toothaches, and skin disease. Because of the stickiness, it was called mum or mummia. You see where the mix up is coming in? So when the invasive colonial Europeans saw the black stuff coating these ancient remains for the first time, they assumed it to be that valuable bitumen or mummia they'd heard about. They were quick to start gobbling it down. The mummified remains of Egyptian pharaohs were sold as medicine in Germany well into the 20th century. And Speaking of the dead, how about using them for decor? Ballroom of Bones is number 9. Not all bones are tasty enough to eat, and sometimes you got more of them than you can handle, so that's where ossuaries come in. In older times when people perished often before 50, there was obviously a lot more human remains to be disposed of. But sometimes there's not more space. So as a space saving technique, the skeletal remains of buried bodies would be dug up and moved into underground crypts called ossuaries. Many more remains could be stored that way, as bones didn't need the whole space space that a body did, and could also be stacked, hung, or broken into position. The Brno ossuary in the Czech Republic is the second biggest in Europe, featuring chandeliers, artwork, words, crosses, really anything that can be made up of bones. These structures and pieces can be incredibly elaborate. Hall State Charnel House features hundreds of hand-painted skulls, and the Sadlik Church ossuary even features a large crown made up of human remains hanging over the pew where they preach from. If you're goth, you may want to consider that for a marriage location. Let's get hot with Greek fire in at number 8. Greek fire, arguably the Jesus of the flame world for its ability to walk on water, baffles historians and scientists alike to this day. Invented in the Byzantine Empire in the 7th century, this fire was used to defend their empire from invaders. Countless documentation verifies to us today that the stories of this fire was very real, but because its formula was a state secret, nobody's quite sure what it was used to create this liquid. The substance could be thrown in pods or shot from tubes. It apparently caught fire spontaneously and could not be extinguished with water. It could burn on top of it. It was heated and pressurized, then delivered via a tube called a siphon at the Grecian enemies. What's truly fascinating about Greek fire is that armies who captured the liquid concoction were unable to recreate it for themselves. They also failed to recreate the machine that it was delivered from. To this day, nobody knows exactly what the ingredients went into this mixture. Dance the day, night, and your life away with number 7 in the countdown. The Kabik incident is one of the first few recorded instances of dancing plagues. Later, there are stories of unstoppable, sometimes fatal, dancing in the German town Effort in 1247. Shortly after, 200 people are said to have danced themselves all over a bridge of the Moselle River in Maastricht until it collapsed, drowning them all. The 1518 event was most thoroughly documented and probably the last of several such outbreaks in Europe, which took place largely between the 10th and the 16th centuries. A woman reportedly stepped into the street and began dancing, seemingly unable to stop, and she kept dancing until she collapsed from exhaustion. After resting, she resumed the compulsive frenzied activity. The more she continued, the more others were afflicted, and within a week 30 others mimicked her strange behavior. Alarmed city officials thought maybe more or better dancing was the solution, so they gathered up the real pros and some music and arranged dancing halls to help the afflicted boogie this out. Instead, the opposite happened, and now as many as 400 people were consumed by the dancing compulsion. A number of them died from their exertions. In early September, the mania began to abate, and that's the 
last we know of this phenomena. So what is this plague? And why were all these people dancing themselves to doom? Well the explanation at the time was the usual stuff like demonic possession or your blood was too hot. Modern day it's likely because of ergot poisoning from molding rye flour used to make their bread as it's been known to cause hysteria and convulsions. To this day hundreds of accounts of dancing plagues are found recorded in dark ages but we have no explanation as to why. I don't see dead people, I see green people. The Woolpit alien children are number 6 in our countdown. Two English chroniclers reported a story from the 12th century that villagers of Woolpit discovered two children, a brother and sister, who had green skin and spoke an unknown language. The children were quickly taken to hire officials, Richard D. Colney's house, where he attempted to communicate and failed. The children also refused to eat for days on end until seeing green beans in the garden which they ate straight out of the ground. They stayed with Richard long term as he converted them to a normal diet and they started to lose the green pigmentation. Obviously after time and growth these children learned English and when they were asked where they were from they told Richard, we are inhabitants of the land of St. Martin, who is regarded with peculiar veneration in the country which gave us birth. They further explained that where they were from everything was green and they had been tending to their father's animals that they followed into a cave. Emerging out of it they found themselves in Woolpit. The sun does not rise upon our countrymen, our land is little cheered by its beams, we are contented with that twilight which among you precedes the sunrise or follows the sunset. Moreover a certain luminous country is seen not far distant from ours and divided by a very but considerable river. Shortly after this description of a non-existent land, Richard took the children to be baptized in a local church, however the boy died very shortly after from an unknown illness. The girl known as Agnes grew into adulthood and married. She remained private and spoke little to many, and so the secret of their original homeland died with her. Children's Crusade is number 5, joining where the wild things are and labyrinth for most bratty and annoying kids is a boy in some stories named Stephen, who claimed to have been given a divine message from God to go forth and conquer the world. He was 12. Anyways, Stephen approached many royals looking for resources only to be turned away. He even asked for the support of King Philip of France who very rationally told the kid to go back home before bedtime. This was directly after the Holy Land Crusades, so it was mainly due to the fact that they believed he wanted to live out a hero legacy like his idols because he was 12. Like prepubescent boys, Stephen wasn't going to drop it when told no. He instead started preaching and recruited a band of faithful children to lead them into the Holy Land. One day, having found someone to supply his large gaggle of children, reportedly over a thousand, with a boat, Stephen loaded everyone up unarmed and unprepared and took to the seas. They were never seen again. It's believed Stephen's ship sank or the children were stolen by the ship crew and brought to Egypt for other unfortunate purposes. No matter what happened, the preachings of Stephen led to what's believed somewhat between a thousand and ten thousand children to their demise. Stephen is one of few documented children crusaders, none of which can technically even be labeled as a crusade because to fall under that title a mission had to be delivered and blessed by a pope. No children's crusade was ever approved. Speaking of holy crusaders, the fate of the Templars is number 4 in our countdown. Founded in 1118 as a monstatic military, their duty was the protection of pilgrims as they traveled to the holy land following the Christian capture of Jerusalem during the first crusade. The Knights of Templar quickly became one of the richest and most influential groups of the Middle and Dark Ages, erecting banks, castles, and churches, their wealth would be their downfall. A secret letter detailed black magic and scandalous sexual activities that was sent through France. The reality of this document was that it was made by King Philip of France, who notoriously stole and plundered from anyone he could. In response, more than 600 Templars are arrested, as well as hundreds of non-warriors who handled the day-to-day -day work such as banking, farming, and organizing. The men were charged with a wide array of offenses including heresy, devil worship, spitting on the cross, homosexuality, fraud, and financial corruption. The Templars meanwhile were kept in isolation and fed meager rations all while facing brutal torture. Given the extreme conditions of medieval methods, it's not a surprise within weeks, hundreds of Templars just confessed to false charges. Their lands and money were confiscated and officially dispersed to another religious order, the Hospitallers, although greedy Philip did get his hands on some of the cash he coveted. Didn't know this guy was real, but the Pied Piper is number 3. The proof is etched in the Hamlinia face itself, an inscribed plaque on the stone facade of the so called Pied Piper's house dating to 1602 reads, AD 1284, on the 26th of June, the day of St. John and St. Paul, children 
children born in Hamlin were led out of the town by a piper wearing multicolored clothes. After passing the Calverly near Copenburg, they disappeared forever. The tale, in fact, has survived a very long time. Originating as medieval folklore, it inspired the Grimm Brothers legend, The Children of Hamlin, and one of Robert Browning's best known poems, The Pied Piper of Hamlin. While there are some small differences in the stories, the basics remain the same. The piper was hired by the people of Hamlin to rid the town of rats. Trailing after their hypnotic notes, the rat catcher and his magical flute made them go to their demise. But when the town refused to pay the piper for his service, the savior came for Hamlin's children. Entranced by the notes of his magic flute, the boys and girls followed the piper out of town and simply vanished. So what happened to Hamlin's children? One theory is that the Pied Piper played the role of a so called locator or recruiter. They were responsible for organizing migrations to the east and they were said to worn colorful garments and played an instrument to attract the attention of possible settlers. Popular opinion is, if this is the case, the children may have been taken to the Berlin area, as the family names common in Hamlin at the time show up in surprising frequency in areas of Uckermark and Prisnik near Berlin. An entry in Hamlin's town records dating 1384 laments that it's a hundred years since our children left. The stained glass window in town St. Nikolai Church, destroyed in the 17th century but described in earlier accounts, reportedly illustrated the figure of the Pied Piper leading ghostly white children away. And St. Anthony's fire number 2 in the countdown is not as cool as it may sound. When people of Paris were tormented with painful boil sore swelling and the sensation of fire in their skin, the only cure seemed to be a trip to St. Mary's Church in Paris. There, Duke Hugh the Great nourished the ill with his holy grain stores, said to help the ill recover. And they did. But as soon as they returned home, they had the plague again with terrible illness. The cause? St. Anthony's fire. The disease starts with faint burning in the skin. Soon red spots covered the infected person's body who felt like their limbs were on fire. Arms would swell and turn bright red, then terrible hallucinations would plague them, convincing them they were being assaulted by demons or dragged to hell. Finally, gangrene would set in and the victim's fingers and toes would drop off one by one. Once infected, few survived. So what caused this horrible disease and why did Holy Grain cure it? Well, if you've seen our video Top 10 Unusual Events from Medieval History, you may know about ergot poisoning. It's a fungus that grows on rye during cold and damp conditions. When the grain is ground up and then made into bread, people consume the fungus and poisoning ensues. So do cues stores of holy grain were better maintained because of his status and they weren't contaminated with ergot. When people ate his grains, their ergotism went away, but as soon as they returned home and they consumed their contaminated grains, they were poisoned again. Ergot would remain undiscovered still for years to come, and many forms of ergot poisoning would manifest in this time. Number one takes the video title seriously though, The Dark Age. It's said the ninth plague of Egypt was complete darkness that lasted for three days. Well, this may not be entirely wrong, with the exception of it actually being eight 18 months. In 536 AD, it said a huge portion of our world went under a dark, mysterious fog that fell on Europe, the Middle East, and parts of Asia. The fog blocked the sun during the day, causing temperatures to drop, crops to fail, and people to die. As a result, countless documents were found in this country of mysterious darkness. However, they weren't taken seriously until the 1990s when researchers in Ireland noticed the rings on the inside of trees indicated some funny business around 536. Summers in Europe and Asia became 35 Fahrenheit to 37 Fahrenheit colder, trying to even reporting summer snow. They realized that the ancient witnesses were really actually onto something. They weren't being hysterical or imagining the end of the world. Now researchers also discovered what may be the main source of the darkness. A volcanic eruption in Iceland in early 536 helped spread ash across the northern hemisphere, creating a fog and altering the global climate patterns causing years of famine. With this realization, accounts of 536 become real horrifying real fast. I mean put it in perspective. One day the world is plunged into darkness and then the sun just never rises again. In primitive times especially, this seemed to have a traumatic effect. We marvel to see no shadows at our, of our body at new, wrote Cassiodorus, a Roman politician. He also wrote that the sun had a bluish color and the moon had lost its luster and the seasons seemed to become jumbled together. Number 10. The Doomsday Book, 1085. The Doomsday Book was created under William the First, also known as William the Conqueror. Like you're already the first man, you don't need two names, come on. This guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah, this is the very first time surveyors went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for simply just doing you. Men would show up at your house asking how much money you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh? Okay and five on that phone plan. Look, tax season's coming up, Arthur. It's not looking good, man. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Imagine owing someone money for just trying to make an honest living. 
Yeah, thank God that didn't catch on, right guys? Oh, speaking of, I got a phone H&R block. Number nine, the Crusades. A three-part mini-series spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for the proprietorship over sacred sites and the land in the East Mediterranean. A three-part mini-series spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred sites and land in the East Mediterranean. Wars that resulted in six million deaths. The Knights Templar, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers horseback bashing their way through the East. These guys were the real deal, almost like the Navy SEALs of their time. We've seen these paintings, the elite fighting force with the red cross painted on their chests. I wonder if they had to do a hell week. These soldiers were the most trained and savage fighters in all the Christian armies. Richard I leading the third and final crusade, earning him the name Richard the Lionheart. Back then the names were always something so aggressive and scary. It was never like Richard the Clownfish or Henry the Pygmy Goat. No, 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 we need fear way more fear. Number eight, the Magna Carta. The year is 1215. We need some laws, people. This document was one of its kind. A document setting out the laws and limitations from the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts. No free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers and the law of the land. Did you get all that? Right there. That down. Except women, they don't have laws. And they can't act in place. Sometimes people needed to face the music. And even animals. Huh? That's right, animals. Being tried in a court. A lively and popular event trying any law breaking animal from goats to pigs to even chickens. Ladies and gentlemen of the court, did you, Mr. Feathers, were peck the floor, yes or no? Objection, Your Honor, leading the witness. My brain can't fathom this, guys. Number seven, the Battle of Bannockburn. This infamous battle between Scotland and England was one of the most important battles of the Middle Ages. The end of the bloody war for independence. Basically, Scotland was like, yeah, we're gonna go over here and our R's. The gruesome wooden wars were caused by the English invading Scotland in 1296. A leader slowly rising the ranks, William Wallace, the guardian of the King of Scotland himself, holds off the English forces and is knighted a hero to Scotland. Unfortunately, like every hero back then, he was also hated. He was captured, hanged, drawn, and quartered. Like, why do you have to do all that after he dies? Like, he's dead. Not fun. The battles between Scotland and England ended in 1314 with Robert the Bruce securing Scotland's independence, adding like 45 more dialects to the UK. Freedom! Number six, the Black Death. Ooh, talk about a curveball. The year's 1348. People are saying things like, don't let the bed bugs bite. Clearly not a very clean and safe time. The Black Death, AKA, Pestilence, aka the Great Mortality, or simply known as the Plague. Single handedly, the worst pandemic ever recorded in history, wiping out somewhere between 70 to 200 million people. Ooh, now I get where Bless You comes from. Someone sneezed back then and everyone's dead at 14. This is where we see those doctors in the terrifying bird outfits with the long noses stuffed with garlic and herbs. Um, excuse me? Yeah, he's not wearing a mask. I'm just trying to watch a cat publicly get skinned. Yeah, six feet please. Some doctors prescribed urinating on a person so that the bad smell would drive out the infection. Can you imagine? Just a doctor writing you up a script and go ahead and pee on yourself about four to five times a day. Take with food. Should be gone early next week. And just let me put my mask back on here before you leave. There you are. The plague started in Europe in October 1347 when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked at the Sicilian port of Messina. Most sailors aboard the ships were already dead, but those who were still alive were covered head to toe in black boils that oozed pus and blood. Ugh. Sometimes the Black Death included fever, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, temporary loss in motor skills, and then of course, death. Number five, Joan of Arc. Finally, a woman in the Middle Ages. Who'd have thunk? Joan of Arc was considered and still is revered the heroine of France for her role in the Siege of Orleans during France's Hundred Year War with England. Joan of Arc, a peasant with faith on her side, had believed that God had chosen her to lead France in victory against England and had spoken to her since she was young. At only age 17, she had stolen men's armors, a white horse, and like a Valkyrie riding into battle, she had convinced an entire army that she was appointed by God to win. And then did! That's the most badass thing I've ever heard in my my entire life. After such a miraculous victory, her reputation spread among France, and upon her capture and death at 19, the Maid of Orleans herself would forever live on as one of the greatest saints and symbols of the country of France.
Number four, Henry V, another war? All these people do is kill each other. Doesn't anyone fish or golf? No one, huh? Just swords and heads, swords and heads. A history itself. This time, England beats France. King Henry V, Prince Hal himself, leans into his kingly duties, demolishing France and what Shakespeare would delve into years to come. The Battle of Agincourt is one of England's most celebrated victories and was one of the most important triumphs in the Hundred Years' War. Then, should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment, Henry V, prologue. Good stuff. How come these guys didn't just like rap battle or play soccer or something? Like an arrow right through the chest is way worse than a red card. Just saying. Hey, speaking of soccer. Number three, mob football. I'm not talking about the mafia. Put a thousand on Brady, would you? I'm talking about mob football, also known as folk football. It's just like our modern day soccer, town versus town. Except it has an unlimited amount of players. And there's only two rules to the game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's lines on the other side of town and no murdering. I mean, I guess this is closer to rugby? Yeah, this, this is literally just rugby. This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed at Oxford University in 1555. Just a guy named Jeeves in a polo. Oh uh, yeah, I play uh, mob football at Oxford. <sighs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm also in a frat. This game got so out of hand, it was banned numerous times in England. There is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise, which God forbid. We command and forbid on behalf of the king, on pain of imprisonment, such game to be used in the city of the future. Thankfully, this game has calmed down over the years and now has become the most popular played and watched game across the world. Go Liverpool! Number two, the printing press. The printing press is a machine that was designed for the mass printing of text mostly in form of books and newspapers. With an unknown date of origin, first invented in China, this machine designed in the 15th century by Johannes Gutenberg was a revolutionary new form of writing which would only change the direction of history with the mass production of uniform text. Eh, long story short, people didn't have to get the world's worst wrist cramp writing Hamlet over and over again. To be or not to be 86 more folios? The alphabetical metal keys would be placed into the device and slammed into the paper, pressing ink upon the parchment. You know there's gotta be some books half written in purple ink cause they just ran out of black. Come on, we've all been there. Ink's expensive. Number one, William Shakespeare. The bard himself, arguably the most influential writer of the English language. William Shakespeare was born in Stratford, England. One of the easiest ways we can look back into the dialogue and lifestyle used by the people living in the Middle Ages. This playwright documents the world in which he lives from 1564 to 1616. Due to Shakespeare's unbelievable talent for building and fabricating an array of diverse stories and characters via players, Modern day is able to see the Middle Ages and the similarities and differences the people were experiencing. His plays are based in the environment that they were written in. He writes about diseases, he writes about monarchy, he writes about women's rights. Okay, so no one actually got turned into a donkey by some fairies in the woods, but some of those wars actually did happen. And some of those kings and queens were really twisted. How this man created so many brilliant works and stories all part of the mystery. Number 10, carrying a sword. Whenever we see in medieval shows or hear stories or see art, everybody always has a sword at their side. I'll admit on one hand, literally, it's pretty badass. Was this really that common though in the 12th century? Was everyone gifted a sword on their 16th birthday like in Zelda Wind Waker? No, no, of course not. I mean, if you were traveling, sure, ideally you'd want a little dagger or a little something to help you out, but swords were a symbol of wealth and status. And the bigger and shinier the tune, the better, right? Right? On average, these things would cost you seven months worth of wages. So you best start saving up and training. Yeah, you might want to train as well because these things were not light. No, not at all. Ideally, medieval swords would weigh three to four pounds. Doesn't sound like much at first, but I know after eight minutes, I would be switching arms real quick. It's like when you hold your hand up in class, you're like, oh God, what's going on here? Gotta do some push-ups. In our number nine spot today, we have the death cage. If you were to take a look at the punishments used in history, it quickly becomes clear that people of the past just really liked watching people die or have pain inflicted upon them. It's very strange, it's very dark, and it certainly is not for the faint of heart. The death cage is just one of the many horrifying punishments used during the Dark Ages. Essentially, this was just one method of execution that was extremely public, as they would strip the person down and lock them in an iron cage that was placed
placed somewhere that everyone would be able to see. From here, the condemned person would be locked in there with no food or water, and everyone would just watch as they slowly died. Unbelievably messed up for a multitude of reasons, for sure. Sometimes, to make matters even worse, however, the condemned person would also be slathered in milk and honey, so that they would also be attracting insects, just to make the whole dying process even worse. It's all bad. I'm just thankful that those days are over. Number 8. The Summer of 1348, aka the Black Death. Now let's talk about this horrible event, shall we? If you thought summer 2020 sucked, well, Buckle up, this one was pretty bad too. The bubonic plague traveled. The bubonic plague arrived to medieval England in 1348, and the death toll here was absolutely devastating. Somewhere from one third to half of England's population gone, just like that. And that's it. The plague hit hard and it hit fast. Now, today we have variations of the virus, the one we shall not name. But back then, the plague was a bacterium now known as Yersinia pestis. Now, symptoms were quite jarring. You got lumps in the groin or your armpits, so that can't be comfortable. And next, the infected would notice black spots appearing all over their body. Almost all that were infected died within three days. More often than not, without a fever, so you wouldn't see it coming, aside from the black spots and the things I just said. Now, the drop in the population resulted in a widespread of wealth. Workers were demanding higher wages, and farmers were demanding lower rents. The poor got expandable income, so... It kind of, kind of helped, kind of didn't. I don't know. I don't know how to explain that. The Black Death spread more than a mile per day, and it's all thanks to traders and travelers. Yeah, humans can't stay still for a bit. We love traveling, even through the Black Death. Because, you know, why not? Roads are empty. As long as there aren't any rats hiding on board, maybe you'll make it. In our number seven spot today, we have the Meowing Nuns. Mass hysteria wasn't necessarily uncommon in the Dark Ages. There are a few instances we could discuss. But for today, I want to talk about one of my favorites. In the book, The Epidemics of the Middle Ages, which was written by J.F. Hecker in 1844, there was the description of a very strange case of mass hysteria that broke out among nuns in a French convent in the Middle Ages. Basically, one day a nun in this French convent started to meow like a cat. I'm not sure why, I'm not sure how this started, all I know is that it happened. And you know what else happened? Other nuns in the convent began to also meow like cats. Eventually, it became such a thing that all of the nuns in the convent would meow together for a certain period of time. And of course, everyone surrounding this area was like, what in the absolute heck is going on right now? This is actually a huge problem because in these times, cats were hated. People associated cats with the devil and with disease. So a bunch of meowing nuns was like the equivalent of doomsday. Apparently, the way that this stopped was that the police came and threatened to whip the nuns if the meowing didn't stop, which is definitely one of the weirdest things I've ever said. Number six. Peddlers. Ah yes, that medieval businessman just wandering along in the pine forest in hopes of not getting robbed. A classic image from medieval times. The Dark Ages were a dangerous game, right? So one could only imagine how hard it must have been for a merchant who travels the countryside for a living to sell goods. In Breath of the Wild, you're like, oh thank god, there's that one guy with all the goods that I need. How convenient is this? Awesome. That's not in real life. In the Middle Ages, traveling village to village wasn't an easy task. You couldn't order an Uber and then voila, and unless you were a knight, you probably didn't have a noble steed to take you there. But even so, an outsider showing up to your village to sell goods from a distant land? I don't know, sounds a little sus if you ask me personally. Peddlers were more often than not welcomed with suspicion by locals. Most of the time, peddlers were just accused of being criminals, even if they weren't. Guy shows up, he's like, hey, wanna buy some watches? They're like, you're a robber, you're going away. In our number five spot today we have donations. In the dark ages it wouldn't necessarily be strange to either donate or sell your own urine. Yeah, the market was hot for urine because they used it a bunch during this time in history. Medieval chamber pots would collect all of the stuff from an entire household or public space wherever they were placed and oftentimes they could later be sold at the local tanner or fuller in town. I mean, talk about an easy way to make some money but how horrible. The reason this product was so popular is because it was used in a variety of ways. It could be used to clean clothing, to help with the dyeing process, to tan leather hides, and like I spoke about in a recent video, be used to help in the cotton making process in order to make the material soft and not frayed. While the practical uses make the wholesale process a little less peculiar, it honestly still would just be weird to have to sell your own pee or your neighbor's pee. Number four, color coordinated. I get it, on Wednesdays we wear pink. It's nice to add a little color into your schedule at work in the office. It's fun, sure, have at it. In medieval times, they were serious about their looks and colors. There was no 
around back then. Having rules about what colors and what type of clothing and hats you could wear, you named it. It was all based on your occupation or social level. Some colors were banned for certain professions. Imagine that. For example, imagine if you were a night worker, right? If I can say that, a woman lady of the night. You weren't allowed to wear certain styles or colors. That's hilarious. Hey, welcome to Ontario. We don't wear jeans here. Got it? All right, now get in. 15th century English law banned knights or anybody below knights from wearing velvet, which is so random to me and so funny looking back now. Imagine that. And you may know this one, but purple was a fancy color back then. Purple has been associated with royalty even since the ancient world. Natural purple dye was rare, and medieval Europeans believed that mixing dyes was unnatural and diabolic. It was a no-no. So they were missing out on purple for quite a while because they didn't want to, you know, mixed goods, if I can say that. In our number three spot today, we have divorce by combat. If you talk to most people who are divorced nowadays, they'll tell you about how awful the divorce proceedings can be. It's expensive, it's time consuming, and sometimes things get pretty heated. While these harrowing tales are definitely less than delightful, things could definitely be worse. And by worse, I mean you could be getting a divorce in the dark ages by way of combat. The first documented instance of this was created by Hans Talhofer in a 1467 man Manuscript. He wrote, quote, As per the instructions, the husband was put up to his waist in a three foot wide hole dug in the ground with one hand tied behind his back. The woman was to be armed with three rocks, each weighing between one and five pounds, and each one wrapped in cloth. Basically, the man couldn't leave the hole, but the woman could run around the edge of the pit. He continued on, quote, If the man touched the edge of the pit with either his hand or arm, he had to surrender one of his clubs to the judges. If the woman hit him with a rock while he was doing so, she forfeited one of her stones. While this sounds like an insane process, it really was true and continued on before growing rare in the early 13th century. Not only has the discovery of this historical practice shed light on something we previously did not know, but it also gives us a glimpse into the gender dynamics of the time period. We're not entirely sure how this sort of divorce ended, but many speculate that this basically continued on until one of them died or one of them surrendered. Number two, bucket family style. For my last one, today we're getting real cozy, real cozy. Remember in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory when all his grandparents have to share that one rickety old bed? Well, that's what everybody at home looked like in the dark ages. Imagine being in the middle, I'm already anxious thinking about it, just stuck. I mean, think about it though, back then space was so limited, warmth is also a plus in those winter nights, and beds, they were massive, they were made of straw and wood, it was a whole thing, it was a whole situation, it's not like you could fit more than one of these in your home, no way Jose. Even in the royal household, this was a common theme. King Richard I of England and King Philip II of France both had to sleep in the same bed as an act of diplomacy. Again, I would be so anxious and awkward there. I'd be like, oh, excuse me, Mr. King guy, you're snoring too loud. In our number one spot today, we have affairs of the court. If you know anything about marriage in the Dark Ages, you know that love was often not a part of it. To sort of piggyback off my last point, if you were in a loveless marriage like most everyone else was in the time, but didn't want to go through the process of beating your spouse to a pulp or any of the other divorce methods at the time, you could instead turn to courtly love. This wasn't for the common household and instead was for members of the court, but it allowed the lords and ladies of the time to experience love and courtship despite what their marital status might be. Yeah. It was a place for married people to go and hook up. Well, not entirely. I mean, there of course were roles in place and society was very pious, so people weren't exactly hooking up. But it was a huge hit. People danced, they giggled, they flirted, and sometimes people could even be caught holding hands. One of the rules of courtly love just stated, marriage is no real excuse for not loving. Kicking off the list at number 10, together at last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other. All because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrews fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. 
Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week. So many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet. So they had to find a way to keep things in place They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent, so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time, so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, that sucks, can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird, go home, relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's knows. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was going to happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches. Just saying. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes, and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? 
I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. And no, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, grand theft witchcraft. If you were a woman in the Middle Ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil, like Brie mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks Abe, good job, good report. The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine, like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, witch or not. The dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop, let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this. How many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches, because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, crimes of the heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only 
bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women. However, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn it. At number 10, water carrier. These days, we have it so easy. We have the internet at our disposal to learn about pretty much anything, we have cars to get us from point A to point B, and all of our resources are close by. We get food from the grocery store and water from the taps in our houses. But back in the middle ages, things were a lot tougher for people, and they had to go through a lot just to get basic life necessities, like water for example. Getting water to people wasn't as easy as you might have thought, and so that's why getting water became a whole profession. In a medieval city, you lucked out depending on the area that you lived in. If you lived close to a river or stream, then you could get all the water you wanted and pretty easily too. But if you weren't so lucky to live near this resource, then you might have had to hire a water carrier to fetch it for you. People sought out strong young men to become water carriers for them, and as the name implies, they would get paid to go to the nearest source of water and bring it back for their employer. This profession became pretty popular in the late medieval period in London, and by this time, so many people were working as water carriers that they created their own fraternity. At number 9, Town Crier. I'm sure you've heard of the Town Crier at some point in your life, right? They're often incorporated into pop culture pieces that take place in the medieval times. When you think of the Town Crier, you might also think of the famous Hear Ye, Hear Ye that is associated with the speeches of the Town Criers. Back in the Middle Ages, the role of the Town Crier was a very important one as it was a crucial way for the local authorities to communicate with the residents of their community. The Town Crier would often make announcements of new laws, royal proclamations, the start of events, and even the punishments of criminals. They were basically the news anchors of the past. Also, as I mentioned, we normally associate the town crier with the phrase hear ye hear ye, but the phrase first started off as oye oye oye, which later evolved into the phrase that we are more familiar with. Before we carry on talking about these strange jobs from back in the days of old, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Scribe. These days, most people know how to read and write. It's part of our basic education, and is one of the first things that we are taught as kids in school. As you progress in society, basic literacy is taught more and more throughout the world, as some people in parts of the world might not have access to this privilege, but back in medieval times, most of the population was illiterate, which made the roles of scribes so crucial. Not everyone had access to the right education, but for those who did and could read and write, they often became scribes. The role of the scribe was as straightforward as the name predicts. Essentially, their job was to write. Scribes were hired to write all kinds of documents ranging from letters to business contracts. One of their hardest jobs though was to copy manuscripts, which was a job that may have taken a scribe several months to complete. Many men and women in monasteries held jobs as scribes, but for common folk in villages, being able to become a scribe was seen as highly valuable as well. At number 7, Reeve. These days we have elected officials in our communities who serve as a sort of voice of the people. Back in the Middle Ages, they sort of had someone similar to that and they were called Reeves. The Reeve was something of a local administrator, and their job was to oversee the day-to-day -day running of a manor, as well as to solve disputes between the peasants. The Reeve was a peasant too, but they were normally elected by their neighbors or chosen specifically by a lord, and served as a Reeve for a one-year period. This job eventually faded away as the feudal system began to decline, but fun fact, you can still find some Reeves in parts of Canada. At number 6, Peddler. This next job from the Middle Ages is one that we kind of still have these days, just a little more modern. We're talking about peddlers. You know how there are people who go door to door trying to sell you something? Like back in the day when Avon used to do house calls? Well, this was essentially what peddlers did. Their job was to travel from village to village to sell various goods. This was how a lot of people in more remote areas were able to buy certain items. The peddler's job was pretty important for the local economy because it was able to bring business to larger areas than just one local town. It seemed like a good enough job, but socially speaking, peddlers were always looked at with suspicion. Oftentimes, local people would accuse peddlers of being criminals. Now, they easily could have been criminals, but it's really a case by case situation. You can't judge someone for just trying to get their coin. At number five, Gong Farmer. Now, 
Now even though there were simple jobs like being a scribe and carrying water to people, there were also some messy and not so glamorous jobs as well. This next one I'm about to tell you about was definitely one of the worst jobs that you could have. See, there was a time before modern sewers and plumbing were a thing. This was a pretty icky time because rather than waste being disposed of in sewers, they were deposited into a privy or cesspit. Now these things had to be cleaned out periodically and guess what? There were people who were hired to do just that. The gong farmer was someone who was hired to maintain the cesspits and so they would be given a large ladle and they would scoop out the waste and transport it away. Now I can only imagine how horrible that job would have been and how horrendous the smell would have been too. It sounds like an absolute nightmare so I'm glad it's not a thing anymore. At number 4, Galley Rower. Now as bad as it might have been to be a gong farmer in the middle ages, there was apparently a job that was much worse that people would do anything to get out of and that was the galley rower. This was considered to be one of the most grueling jobs from the middle ages and I can see why. These people would be tasked with working on a galley and rowing a ship along with a team of up to a thousand other people. Apparently people hated this job so much that they would try and avoid being picked to be a galley rower at all costs. Many people would join the pre priesthood in order to become exempt from becoming a galley rower. Usually this job would go to the poorest peasants and even slaves as it became more and more difficult to find people for the job. That was one occupation that everyone agreed was the worst. At number 3, cut bearer. Now this is a job that I wish was still around. Not because it's a great job or anything, but I feel like it could have been cool to have my own personal cup bearer so I could feel like a queen, you know? The job of the cup bearer was pretty self explanatory. Their whole occupation was to serve the monarch their drinks. Now I know I said I would have wanted a cup bearer so I could feel like a bougie queen, but the cup bearer's job was a little more important than just serving drinks. See, there was always the fear that the reigning monarch could get poisoned because it was a very common act of treason back in the Middle Ages. The cupbearer was the only person tasked with serving drinks to the king or queen because they had to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, even if it meant tasting the drink themselves before serving it just to make sure that all was well in the cup. A lot of trust had to be put into this cupbearer so they could be quite influential in the courts if all went well. They were risking their lives and safety doing a pretty basic task, but it was for the good of the realm. At number 2, Alewife. Speaking of drinks though, let's talk about how the drinks got into the cups and who made them. In medieval England, women were mostly tasked with the practice of brewing ale and they were aptly named alewives as a result. Alewives were very important not only for business but also for the good of their families. Brewing was a quote, small scale, low investment, low profit, low skilled industry, but it brought success to a lot of married women as well as a substantial amount of independence since this would have essentially been their business and their own source of income. These women would always be hard at work brewing because they sold their ale quite quickly. Ale didn't have a very long shelf life and so they would make and sell their beverages quickly to keep up with demands and to compete effectively with others in the trade. Eventually though, the alewife was extinguished by the 15th century as brewing became more commercialized and people sought to take the independence of women away. And finally at number 1, alchemist. As you can probably imagine, science wasn't all that advanced back in the middle ages. There wasn't really much understanding of how the world worked. Back in these days, there were people who tried to practice science in a way that they knew how before many advancements in the field came out and these people were called alchemists. These alchemists believed that it was possible to change metals and chemicals. They tried to purify metals to change them into other things and one of the most common experiments was trying to convert tin into gold or silver. For other alchemists though, their mission was to come up with new medicines to heal people and cure them of their ailments. Alchemists were quite popular until the 17th century as the ideas behind alchemy were replaced by the science of chemistry. I guess you could say that alchemy walked so that chemistry could run. Kicking off the list at number 10. Boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man. Trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, 
water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random times so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, the rack. On to something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, just a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. It would just leave you hanging by these ropes and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable, honestly. Hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done, folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually, yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid, it was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint-hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. Number five keel hauling. Not to be confused with kegels, keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles, then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot. It's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard. Anything. Number four, solitary confinement. 
This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and I whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away at your little piggies were, number three, rats. Another Game of Thrones classic. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat. That's cool, but maybe cover Stuart Little's eyes for this one. Rats as a medieval punishment, where do I even start? Okay, this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time. What was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach. Now inside this metal enclosure, there's rats, which are also just loose walking around and the person can feel them, the little feet walking around in their skin. And this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure Historically, it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath, which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. From there, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that, they find your skin and then that they can obviously bite through. So you can paint the picture in your head. It's disgusting. Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost just lying there where somebody is then tied to it and everybody else just hammers them and beats the shit out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do. Straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull and basically it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture, often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big closed cauldron and usually it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one, when it's in the movie Saw. So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bull and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed, it sounded like a bull's roar. Now kicking off our list at number 10, the boot. Anything that starts with a the, it's bad news right there. Oversized boots made of iron or copper, these are a little different than Uggs, pay attention. These boots were often brazed onto the floor, so the accused, well, ideally they couldn't move around anywhere at all. Most of the time they were just sitting upright, they were stuck, it was welded to the ground. The boots at this time were filled with boiling water or molten lead both pretty bad. And from that point on, well, it's not gonna be great. You're probably not gonna survive. Another medieval punishment involving boots, which is somehow worse, in my opinion, was first seen in Ireland. They were lightweight metal boots that were filled with water and then heated over a fire until the water was boiling as well as your feet. I don't know, comment down below, which is worse? To me, the second one is way worse. I don't like a slow boil. I don't like that. A watched pot never boils. Maybe that trick will work, who knows? Number nine, the instep borer. We'll start at the feet and we'll make our way up through the body, why not? The instep borer was a medieval German punishment instrument. Again, quite creative, these medieval folks. This iron boot was much more mobile than the last pair of boots, that one for sure. See, this was just one shoe, rather. A shoe that hinged open to allow your foot to slide in. And then from then on out, just trouble. Slow chaos. A crank would protrude out of the top of the foot, and if you were to turn said crank slowly, well, on the inside of this iron shoe was a thick serrated iron blade, cutting deeper and deeper with each rotation of the crank. This location of this crank was purposeful because most of the time, the accused would bleed out fast. No recovering from that one. Still better than Uggs, in my opinion, but whatever. Number eight, 
Branks. Ah, the Branks. Here we go. Sounds horrible. Branks were used to punish nagging wives, or slandering wives, or cursing wives, or women who performed or practiced witchcraft. If you criticize Christianity, love it. But if you had an opinion, or you can do math, you get the Branks, pretty much. It was horrible. A scold's bridle, or Branks, much more fun to say, was a device usually reserved for women. Yeah, classic medieval times history. It wasn't just a muzzle either. We always look at it as if it was a muzzle. No, it was a lot worse than that. It was a cage for the head with an iron plate projecting into the mouth, even pressing down on top of the tongue. More often than not, this plate was studded with spikes so that if the tongue moved at all, ergo, if you were to speak, it would cause you to bleed out. Now again, you can't open your mouth with this device, so that is double trouble. It was first seen in Scotland back in 1567 and later used in England. Branks were commonly used, again, on women of the lower classes whose speech was troublesome. Yeah, what does it even mean, right? Some shaped like an animal's head, so you'd have a cow for somebody that was considered lazy, a donkey for someone considered a fool, a hare for an eavesdropper, or a pig for a glutton. Yeah, God forbid you had an opinion in the Dark Ages. Number seven, the iron chair. Not to be confused with the iron throne, although I'm sure that one wasn't too comfortable to sit on. Just a chair of swords. The iron chair has spikes covering the back, all along the armrests, the seat, there's spikes, there's spikes everywhere. It's dangerous. 500 to 1500 rusty spikes on average per chair. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of welding work. My gosh. The victim's wrists were tied to the chair, of course, because you'll want to get off of it immediately. Now that's bad enough, being stuck sitting on this chair, but some variants got creative and made it even somehow worse. Some variants of the iron chair had holes underneath the chair's bottom, and that's where red hot coals would be placed to cause you severe burns. It's like from Casino Royale, only a lot, lot worse. Sometimes weights would even be added, making matters much worse. Now this chair was meant to get a confession out of the accused because although it sounds quite fatal, no spikes could actually penetrate a vital organ and wounds were closed immediately by the spikes themselves. Sounds awful, but it wasn't the worst. I mean, it is, but you know what I mean. You didn't die all the time. Number six, coffins. I'm not talking about, you know, these types of coffins with vampires like, you know, coffins you bury in the ground. That would be a bad way to go out, no doubt about it. But this coffin that I'm talking about, much, much worse. Here, the victim was placed up high, not down below. They were placed up high in a cage that was so small, you could barely fit inside of it. Stuck in one spot, usually with limbs sticking out. The live victim was, most of the time, left to starve or die of thirst or exposure. Yeah, those limbs sticking out, insects, the sun all day, it doesn't matter what you get at this point, but it's slow and it's gonna suck. And of course, in medieval fashion, it's gonna be quite public. Everyone's not working, no one has jobs in medieval times, we're all just watching some guy stuck in a cage, we're like, sure, this is it, we're living. UFC, number five, denailing. <sighs> okay, the forcible extraction of one's fingernails or toenails or both, lovely. Hey, before we move on, let's give that thumbs up a click. Yeah, the little thumbnail right there that we see on the screen. Let's spread a little positivity into this list. I need it, I don't know, I feel like you need it as well. Thank you so much, back to denailing. This was a favorite method of medieval punishment because, well, sounds horrible, but it was easy. You just needed a really strong guy and some medieval pliers and, well, Bob's your uncle. You're getting the confession. A variant used in medieval Spain introduced a sharp wedge of wood underneath the flesh and in between the actual nail itself which is horrible. The wedge was then slowly hammered into this grove more and more until the nail popped off. Yeah, thumbs up for thumbnails popping off in history. We try here on B. Number four, Dimnaccio ad bestias, also known as killing by wild animals. I'm a dog lover too, I can't read this one. Dimnaccio ad bestias was a form of Roman capital punishment in which the accused was killed by wild animals in the arena. Now, at this point, you may be thinking, oh, kind of similar to Gladiator and what they had to do. No, this was much sooner. This was a little different. This was 80 years sooner. Now, at this point, and Gladiator, they could defend themselves to some degree. Those meeting their fate with this method, they were always defenseless, and sometimes tied to one spot. Or they were given a small weapon made of wood. It was an insult, really, no chance of surviving. This form of punishment was seen in ancient Rome starting around the second century BC, but 80 or so years later, the Colosseum then saw a similar practice. Only then it was public viewing, it was a big spectacle, it was an event, and most importantly, gladiators could fight back with tridents or nets. Both are horrible. I'd rather just get it done with, to be honest. I'm not fighting a lion. No way. Look at me. I'm like 110 pounds soaking wet. I'm not gonna fight. I'll fight a zebra, maybe. I'll fight like an emu. I could probably take an emu. Number three, hanging. Again, a little straightforward, but I'll try and provide some history for this one. Sure, some hanging history. Okay. Ugh. Hanging is quick. 
I mean, that's when it's supposed to be. Hanging can be one of two ways, suspension by the limbs as a form of punishment, or hanging by the neck as a form of capital punishment. We don't often think about the first version, being strung up by an arm, that's gotta suck, that's pretty uncomfortable. I can't even raise my arm in class for longer than five minutes. I gotta switch it up, know what I mean? These shoulders are weak. Strapado, oh, this would have been a nightmare. Strapado was the form in which your wrists were tied behind your head, eventually causing your shoulders to dislocate. I don't know what's worse out of all three of those. They all suck. I would do the get it done with, honestly. I don't want to live for any of this. Number two, rats. If you're a rat lover, this one's gonna suck. I know some people have rats. They like to do tricks and crawl around their neck and in their mouths. That's cool. I'm not a rat guy myself, but don't knock it till I try it. Rat punishment originated in ancient Rome, and ever since then, it unfortunately has been part of the most horrible, gruesome punishments every era past. What was once called a rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal bin or an enclosure, a bucket of some sorts, strapped to his abdomen or his chest. Now inside this enclosure, there are rats, which the strapped down person can definitely feel walking and sniffing around on your bare skin. Now this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure. Historically, hot coals were usually placed on top, which of course very quickly creates a bad hot environment for these rats inside. Now from here, these rats begin to panic, right? They frantically search for a way out, any way out, because like us, they have survival instincts. Metal enclosure is too hard to bite into, but a human's flesh is not. You can probably eat your way through that. You can see where this is going and you probably just went <gasps> at your computer. Yeah, there we go. Now you get it. Let's move on. Poor rats as well, right? Like, come on, those little animals, they don't want to do that. They don't want to eat a six pack today. I don't want that. Finally, number one, the rack. The rack was a device that was made out of a wooden rectangle as a frame. You've probably seen this in Game of Thrones and that's about it. The person being punished here would have their limbs attached to the four sides with chains and then the people doing the punishing with the helps of rollers and pulleys and a couple of very strong, very strong guys. They would stretch out the person until either the limbs were torn clean off from the body or they got pulled out from their sockets and then couldn't be used anymore. As I'm saying this, I want to faint. This is so horrible. I said I felt lightheaded typing this up. This is really bad. Imagine being around in a time where people actually used to do this and you didn't just watch it on Game of Thrones for 12 bucks a month. And again, more often than not, it was public. It's so embarrassing watching your shoulder get popped out. You're like, oh, just stop. Number 10 is got your nose and your ears and a couple other limbs because ancient civilization globally shared the unique agreement in the removal of someone's nose, ears, or both as the punishment for a crime. Tokugawa era Japan is no different. While flogging was a common penalty for crimes such as thefts, fighting, public intoxication, etc., amputation of the nose or ears or both replaced flogging as a penalty very early in this time, which it didn't last. This period of Japan follows a particularly violent one, and in the time of Tokugawa, they repealed a lot and calmed a lot of the criminal punishment laws from before. Regardless, commit the crime and pay the fine with mutilation. People who experienced this punishment were socially marked for their crime and were banished from hiding it. No big deal for those who had already been punished with exile in accompaniment of mutilation of their nose and ears. Female culprits of crimes that were punishable with mutilation, however, were never mutilated, but they were ordered to parade through the village naked, so I mean pick your poison. Speaking of a woman having to pick her poison, number 9 is the tobacco ordeal. This is one of the most fascinating trial and ordeal ordeals that I have come across in my time researching. While there isn't much information, what little there is is unique to say the least. So, a woman who has committed a crime goes through trial and ordeal the way that a man would, but often has different and less visceral ordeals. A favored way was the tobacco ordeal. A woman would be made to smoke several pipes full of tobacco, and the ash of the pipe was to be put into a cup of water as she did. No ash was to be spilled anywhere but the cup. This water and ash combo would be mixed together by a finger or spoon and once the woman has finished her appointed number of pipes, she would have to drink the full cup of water. It was believed any woman who could smoke the tobacco and drink the ash water without feeling sick or dizzy was an innocent woman. Anyone who could not was guilty. Guilty of being a normal person, because who is drinking out of an ash cup and not feeling like death after? But anyways. Number 8 is the world's uncoolest face tat. Your parents could be disappointed about that face tat you chose, but imagine how much more disappointed they would have been if it was a government issued one smack dab in the center of your forehead. Tattooing in Japan can be traced back to 14,000 BC to 300 AD, when they were believed to hold a mystical significance. Afterwards, the culture moved away
away from tattoos well until the Edo period, where it came back in a very different way. For some duration of the time, a stamp like forehead tattoo was the go to punishment for a non violent offender, like a thief, a loiterer, a vandal, whatever. It was classified as a type of corporal punishment like flogging was. Now, usually it came with expulsion, which unlike exile doesn't kick you from the whole town, but it can kick you from your previous neighborhood. It was a fantastic record keeping tab, however, as the tattoos were chosen by each region and was unique to them, making criminals from other areas identifiable. In most societies, if a tattooed criminal re offended, they did receive the death penalty. However, some of the civilizations had a three strikes, then you're out system. In 1745, tattooing replaced the previously discussed facial mutilation as society became gentler and less bloodthirsty. This continued over the years with face tattooing changing to the less embarrassing and quite fashionable by today's standards arm tattoo. In 1872, the newly established government of Japan abolished the tattoo penalty for once and all. Let's get uncomfortable with number seven, the steak ordeal. This fun ordeal starts with two large vertical stakes driven into the ground on one of Tokugawa's three execution grounds. There would be multiple sets of these stakes depending on the height and weight of accused facing the stakes. This is because the body was to be stretched taunt between the two stakes, tied by the wrist and the ankle joints. They start with the wrist to, sus to suspend the body and make it easier to tie the ankles, but once the victim was up on those stakes, their weight was all on them. Anyone tied up in this torturous fashion was forced to remain this way until they either confessed or, well, Died somehow. Hanging by the hair of the head was another staking ordeal. Obviously, this wasn't something doable for someone without long hair, but worry not, as long hair was cultivated between both sexes, so there was never any shortage of torture options. While held aloft by two others, someone would tie the victim's long hair into a knot at the top of the stake frame. So, once they're tied, they let the weight of the person all hang from that hair until they confessed or something uncomfortable to imagine happens. So, number six is gonna make me even more nauseous, it's tendon cutting. This makes me very squeamish, I'm gonna go fast. A customary punishment before and during the Edo was to cut the Achilles tendon of both feet. This was to maim a person for the rest of their life. No hunting, no working, heck it couldn't walk in most cases, and you lost muscle connectivity that even aided in hip motion. This punishment makes you depend solely on others for the necessity of life. Seeing as this was usually a punishment for manslaughter or a passion killing, your family would have very likely disowned you anyways, leaving you alone to figure this out. One documented account is of an old man who had to move his body by dragging his legs using his hands and carrying two small blocks of wood in each to protect them as he did. If your tendons were spared, it was only to be exiled from your home and city forever or to be executed. Anatsurushi is number five. The Japanese were incredibly determined to keep Christian colonialists out of their nation. They represented imperialism and they were known to be dangerous outsiders, bringing foreign diseases and unnecessary wars in politics. Essentially, they didn't come quite Quietly, they came quite noisily and bossily, and the Japanese just weren't feeling that. Now, the method they chose actually turned out to be incredibly effective and withheld Christianity from the country for far longer than many others had. This is because it was a wildly brutal method. Anatsurushi was used in the 17th century to coerce Christians to recant their faith after entering Japan. Victims would be hung upside down, suspended by their feet, and often lowered into a hole, itself often filled with excrement at the bottom. A cut would be made in the forehead or around the temple area in order to let the blood pressure decrease in the area around their head. The aim was to break their resolve, to renounce their faith, or they would eventually die. For this reason, one of their hands would be left free and exposed so they may signal upwards a willingness to recant. Both Japanese and Western Christians are known to have been submitted to this torture. Sometimes there was a doctor around just to resuscitate them so they can continue being tortured. They were also subjected to head down crucifixion and water crucifixion. Water style was carried out by putting an upside down cross at the shoreline low enough that the tide at low tide and waiting for the tide to rise so that the person would eventually drown. Christians were treated this way until 1873 when Christianity was finally allowed into Japan. And since we're already on the topic, number four is crucifixion. While it's unclear when crucifixion was introduced into Japan, likely 12th to 16th century, it had already had a 2000 year history when that when they did. So the Japanese added some of their own twists to it, as you heard previously with the mention of an upside down or a water crucifixion. It was one of the three executions executions reserved for the worst of offenders. Alongside beheading and hanging, sometimes the three punishments would be mixed and matched. For example, crimes against individuals of higher social status and against family members or one's master could result in beheading prior to crucifixion. Adultery, theft, and subterfuge are all crucible offenses as they threatened both the social and political order. The person to be crucified would be carried out on horseback nude, a lot 
adding to the humiliation of their sentence. He'd be poked and prodded with staffs by the assigned guards who would also carry a large banner with the person's name, offense, and punishment. Oh yeah, they aired your dirty laundry on the march to your grave. This route would also be set to pass the accused residence as well as the location of their crime scene. The accused was then tied at the execution site, and when the cross was risen and mounted with the accused tied upon it, the guards used their staffs to spear him repeatedly until a final thrust to the throat for an ending blow. The boiling point is number three. Large cauldrons were used by the Japanese for boiling fish to retrieve oil, preparing rice, soups, and cooking people alive. This particular torture was a remnant of the warring states period that I've mentioned to come before Tokugawa. They were completely masochismic in that time period. The Tokugawa Empire saw that and ended quite a few of these punishments because of it. But not at first. This is why I can tell you how the Tokugawa would fill these jumbo sized cauldrons with cold water and put it over over a blazing fire. As the water began to warm, the accused would be told hop on in. What starts as an arguably nice toasty bath begins to boil. The accused is to remain in hot water until they confessed. Now this was only used as an ordeal when the judge and jury were very convinced of a person's guilt, but the person just wasn't fessing up. It could sometimes also constitute as a mode of punishment or execution. For example, an entire family in the 16th century were boiled alive in a gigantic bathtub as a punishment for a failed assassination. Another fun ordeal was using a pan of boiling water and having the accused dip their arm into it. If they refused to do it, they were assumed guilty. If they didn't got burned, they were also assumed guilty. Only if you could stick your arm in boiling water and come out unscathed are you innocent, because that makes sense. Number two, we pull the saw, or don't. Don't will sound better in a second. So like a few others on this list, the Tokugawa's let this torturous execution method from the past dynasty enter into theirs. However, they made some changes in the brutality of it. But before this change, this execution method allowed for an interactive experience. So step right up boys and girls, who is twisted enough to slowly saw at the head of a man buried alive? In a book by Louis Freud regarding Japanese history, he describes the grisly execution of a samurai slash bounty hunter. The man had attempted to claim a bounty target, but missed his shot. While he had escaped, it wasn't for long. He was captured and identified, and he was sentenced to the pulling the saw. The man had been buried up to his neck, and a saw set up next to him, with the signboard inviting passerbys to cut at his neck, slowly hacking the men's head off alive. Now traditionally this saw is also placed close enough to the victim's throat that the accused, while buried alive, could make the decision to speed up the process if they really wanted to. But like I said, changes were made. Metal saws, they were replaced with bamboo ones, and rather than being used to actually saw off the living's heads as they once were, they were now simply put on public display next to the condemned person for periods of days prior to their execution by other means. And number one is the painful honor seppuku, which literally translates means self disembowelment. So before I unpack that statement, there are two forms of this execution, voluntary and obligatory. Voluntary is pretty rare. Circumstances such as warriors defeated in battle awaiting execution by their enemies and not wanting the dishonor of that. Meanwhile, obligatory seppuku refers to the method of capital punishment for samurai to spare them the disgrace of being beheaded by a common executioner. This form of execution was ritualized as a result. Great emphasis is put on the proper performance of the ritual. It's to be carried out in the presence of one or more witnesses sent by an authority who had ha issued the execution. While kneeling, the samurai would take a small dagger or short sword from a small table placed before him. The proper method, developed over several centuries, was plunging this weapon into your left abdomen, drawing the blade up laterally to the right, and then turning it upwards. A truly exemplary samurai would then remove the blade and push it into his sternum across the first cut and then up to pierce the throat. This is a brutally painful and extremely slow death to experience. Weirdly, for this twisted reason, it was favored by the warrior code used by the samurai as an effective way to demonstrate the courage, self control, and strong resolve of the samurai and to prove the sincerity of purpose even when facing their own crimes. Women of the samurai class also committed ritual takings of lives, but instead of slicing the abdomen, they slash their throat with a short sword or dagger. A little easier on the girlies, I guess. Number 10, the switchblade comb. Hey, leather jackets, smacking jukeboxes, and a switchblade knife. Nobody was cooler than the fawns on happy days. Well, maybe your uncle. Everybody has a cool uncle. But something I just think is silly, or something a lot of men probably use today, or at least the super cool guys who have no idea what or who the fawns is, 
the switchblade comb. Basically, it's the same thing as a switchblade, but instead of a small blade, you got something to comb your hair with. Because when you're a man, you have to look fresh and tough at the same time. Trust me, ladies, it's, it's how we operate. Gotta look tough, gotta look mean. And kick the jukebox, Hey. Number nine, the ball jacuzzi. I don't know about you guys, but there is nothing better than a nice hot tub. I'd like to say I spend a lot of time in hot tubs with cute girls. However, due to my financial situation, however, most of the hot tubbing that I've done has been at public pools where I shared a hot tub with older Italian and Greek men who I swear were still wearing sweaters, but that was just their hair. Speaking of hair and saggy skin, meet the Tescuzzi, a tiny hot tub for the Pisha deal and two matzo balls. Hey, I understand, your undercarriage has to stay clean and honestly, I would love one. Chris and I were talking about we want one, we might even share one. Who knows? Number eight, the all-in-one. All right, man, this one goes out to us. The manly men, the dads, the sons, the brothers. The men who work all day and night and still have time for their family. I appreciate you and I see you, brother. Want to know why we have so much time, ladies? Well, that's because we've cut back on time in the shower with a very five-head invention. We call it body wash or face wash. Or shampoo, because we use it for everything. Three in one, yes, that's right. If we buy a body wash product, that means it will be used all over our bodies. No time for L'Oreal Pantene, or that purple shampoo with the kangaroo. We speed run shower so we can get back into doing the things that you ladies love. Like not putting the toilet seat down. Number seven, king of the porcelain throne. Kings, I hear you. Life can be busy and the shower speed run is not the only product that we've invented. Here's another shout out to all my kings who take extra time while sitting upon the porcelain throne. I salute you. Yes, that's right. Besides doing the hygienic process of evacuating one's bowels, we take a mental health break in the bathroom. A time to check in, relax, take inventory, and take a breath of some not so fresh air. Especially if you ate Taco Bell the night before. Is it strange to sit there in that situation? Perhaps. But like any other guru, we need a space to feel our spirituality. Would Yoda be Yoda if he didn't meditate? Mmm, sit on the toilet, I will. Number six, the beard apron. This is just so smart, and I'm seriously considering buying one because this is the bane of my existence. Sometimes the lumberjack look is too much for me, and the closer I get to looking like Chris Farley, the better. I think I have a great motivational speaker impression. Maybe I'll show you guys one day. We'll see. I don't know. However, when shaving my beard, I have nowhere to go, and it's too cold in the winter to do it outside, so... That's why this is so smart. Basically, it's an apron that you post up like a hammock. So when you're shaving down those chiseled cheekbones of yours, all the little hairs fall into the apron. That way your GF can't yell at you because there's no mess to be made. Necessity truly is the mother of all invention. Number five, bacon products. Who doesn't love bacon, right? Bacon is delicious. Bacon is a delicious meat that can be enjoyed for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Personally, there was nothing like waking up on a Saturday morning as a kid to play some GameCube and eat bacon and eggs, my favorite. I was a tubby kid and I was easy to impress. However, while bacon may not be the king of the breakfast table, it is the bootleg flavor of fragrance and the non-food market. It seems every time there's a store, gift shop, or novelties being sold, a bacon flavored, scented, or themed product is there for men. And it's not far behind. Because yes, we are tough and rugged. And we eat meat because we're cowboys. So that also means we want breath mints that are artificially bacon flavored, right? No, we don't. They taste horrible. It's awful. No one wants that. Nobody wants that. Number four, bath bomb. Call it genius marketing, crazy society, or people wasting money, but a lot of hygiene beauty products that women purchase, men do too. They just gotta repackage it and inject it with 300 cc's of testosterone because men. Take the hand grenade bath bomb for instance. Taking bath bomb to a whole other level. Yes, the one I saw while researching was very colorful and it looked like it had a fruity scent, but it was shaped like a hand grenade from the second world war. No way an adult man would fall for that, right? Pfft, no. Chris, you see my rubber ducky? Number three, the man bun. Honestly, I don't mind this trend. I actually think it looks good. Certainly better than the mullets of the 90s. There's no way you can tell me mullets look better than man buns. You just can't. The man buns are actually somewhat organized. Especially if dudes grow them out and maintain them. However, what is strange to me is the man bun add-on. Yeah, it's like a man bun extension. You just like a clip-on. Basically, look like the guy who plays Wonderwall at every party for the low, low price of $19.99. I can't be dissing too much, though, because I wore a clip-on tie to the ninth grade. But the girls thought I was cute? I think? I think so. Number two, gendered products. 
Another broad stroke here, but when things get placed into categories, there's always two colors that get used. Pink for girls, blue for boys. While I'm not sure whether colors are actually masculine or feminine themselves, it has been hardwired into most of us, that's just how it goes. Anything plastered in blue or male-like imagery, it's what's meant for men. I, however, as a kid had an absolute five-head play. To protect my valuables from thieves and villains in the night, I always chose something that was girl-themed, pink, or something a boy wouldn't pick. As I thought if presented with my stolen items, I could always identify them since only a boy would choose girly stuff. From my Nintendo DS to my notebooks and honestly everything in between. I, Hot Pink was in and Chetty made it work. I thought the plan was foolproof. I, I never really thought though what would happen if a girl took my stuff though. That, that, that didn't, I didn't really think that wouldn't work for that, would it? No, it wouldn't. Number one, wine in a can. This one is just so silly to me and for any wine connoisseurs out there, take this with a grain of salt. I'm no sommelier, but I enjoyed the odd glass of wine, even if it comes from a box. I always thought the wine glass was elegant, higher class, but that doesn't mean you have to be higher class to drink it, or be less masculine. Well, now there's wine in a can for men, because we can't have flimsy glasses, we'll break those glasses because we're so strong. Oh yeah. 